As it re relates to transverse myelitis, sort of break it up into two sections. So acute pain, which during the acute throes of a spinal cord attack, most often people will have severe back pain as their pain syndrome. Um, but later on, the chronic pain, which is, again, the most disabling part of uh, pain in transverse myelitis, uh, is the neuropathic pain, the musculoskeletal pain, which I'll get back to. And if you look at sort of the percent of folks who experience in pain in transverse myelitis, it's actually more than 50%. And this is sort of just a ballpark figure. Um, I would venture to guess that close to 75% of people experience some type of pain as it relates to transverse myelitis. And there are some studies that actually demonstrate or show that the severity of the transverse myelitis attack actually corresponds to how the pain will be long-term. Uh, for example, there were a couple of recent publications looking at the difference between neuromyelitis optica pain and MS pain as it relates to transverse myelitis. And it seems like the neuromyelitis optica folks, or NMO, uh, are the ones that have more intractable pain and more difficult uh, treatment. And the reason for that, it's all about real estate. So if you look at the extent of involvement of the transverse myelitis and where it affects, that can kind of give you an idea of how severe the symptoms will be or the disability will be as a result of the attack. And so a couple MRIs here. I won't go over this in great detail, but just to look at here on the left panel is a patient who has neuromyelitis optica. And on the right panel is a patient who has multiple sclerosis. Now, when you look at these films, this is a profile shot looking at the side. The spinal cord, normal spinal cord is up above here where you see it's nice and dark. And as we move down through the spinal cord, you can see it gets brighter. This is an area of inflammation and an area of where the transverse myelitis is occurring in this NMO patient. And if you look at sort of a cross section or a bird's eye view, you can see that it encompasses the whole entire spinal cord versus a patient um, who has multiple sclerosis. And you can see that the lesion here is smaller and it's only encompassing part of the spinal cord. So you can imagine the more real estate you take up from this transverse myelitis attack, inflammation, damage, the more pain that will likely be associated with it. Now, when you look at sort of the common types of pain, and by, by no means is this a, a complete list, but these are some of the common types of pain. Neuropathic pain seems to be the, the most prominent pain syndrome that we see uh, post-TM, and actually in neurological disorders in general. Where can neuropathic pain occur? Really anywhere. So as it relates to transverse myelitis, most people will tell us that there's discomfort in their arms or legs, sometimes in their torso. Um, some of you have explained to us in clinic that, oh yeah, I get this really bad sort of burning discomfort around my chest or abdomen, and it feels like someone's just squeezing the life out of me. For MS patients, they talk about that this is the MS hug. Um, there are, is also this proxismal motor spasm, which is analogous to spasms like the Charlie horse. Uh, this can happen commonly actually after a TM, and this can be pretty disabling, and oftentimes it's worse at night. Then there are the musculoskeletal uh, pain-related syndromes, which I think this area is overlooked quite often. So we always focus on the neuropathic pain, and then we talk about these spasms, but we have to realize that the musculoskeletal system uh, actually takes the brunt of a lot of transverse myelitis long-term. For example, if your walking um, is impaired and you're using an assist device to walk, you're putting strain on different parts of your body that don't necessarily, um, or they're not used to having so much strain in that, in that particular region. And then of course, Dr. Mayer did a great job in reviewing spasticity and how that relates to TM and sort of the tail end of this talk, I have a few slides on spasticity, which I won't go into great detail because I think Dr. Mayer did a great job with that. Um, so, neuropathic pain. I don't have to tell you guys what it is, right? So, we hear in clinics, it's burning, tingling, shooting, this electric shock-like sensation. Uh, we talked about that band-like discomfort. Um, typically, it's worse at night, and this is not really well understood why. Uh, my interpretation of it is, is that, you know, when you're active during the day, moving around, you sort of don't focus on the pain as much as when you're about to go to sleep and rest for the night. And that causes a lot of problems, as you can imagine, right? So if you're in constant pain, 
at night, you're not going to get a lot of sleep. Then the subsequent days are going to be fatigued. Um, you're not going to be in a very good mood, just like I'm not when I don't get sleep. And so I think it, it becomes uh, problematic. And the next slide will talk about some of those other associated symptoms. Now, with regards to treatments, there are a variety of treatments for neuropathic pain, which we'll discuss. But classically, the standard over-the-counter medicines like ibuprofen, Advil, aspirin, don't really work so well in neuropathic pain. And the reason for that is this is nerve pain. So if you have a swollen joint, have arthritis, there's inflammation related to those type of conditions, certainly the non steroidals can help with that. But the nerve-related pain, we have to use other medications. And oftentimes, it's not just one medication we have to use, we have to use multiple medicines, which um, I think Dr. Mayer had, had highlighted that, you know, it's great that we have a lot of these oral agents available, um, but we have to be careful because of the side effects that can result from them as well. Now, this is a short list of the possible associated symptoms that can come from neuropathic pain. Um, and, you know, I just would like to point out that it's like the chicken or egg scenario, right? So sometimes we're not quite sure what's causing what. You know, is it the pain that results into anxiety, depression, insomnia, or is it vice versa? Um, and what I usually tell people is that if you have a combination of these symptoms, you have to treat for example, if you have pain and depression, you have to treat both in order to get somewhere. So it's very important to, to know that. <clears throat> Management-wise, um, there are pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions that we use for treatment of pain, and specifically neuropathic pain. A lot of the medications that we use for neuropathic pain are actually used for other conditions. And the reason for that is these medicines work on ion channels and they work in neurotransmitters, which are intimately involved in uh, neuropathic pain. So a variety of anti-epileptic medications we'll use, antidepressants. Um, sometimes we have to actually escalate the therapy to uh, narcotic medications. But I, I don't want to underemphasize the non-pharmacological interventions that we have for treating pain, because I think these are just as essential as the medicines. Um, so warm and cold compresses uh, can sometimes help. Pressure stockings, believe it or not, uh, can sometimes help as well. Acupuncture, you know, this has been around for thousands of years. We don't understand exactly how it works, um, but if you talk to people, and there are some small studies that show that acupuncture does seem to help with some type of pain. Not only neuropathic pain, but uh, musculoskeletal pain as well. Now, if all else fails, there are some neurosurgical interventions that are undertaken to help with pain. Um, you heard Dr. Mayer mention a little bit about some of the more, I refer to them as barbaric interventions, where um, you're cutting nerves or cutting the spinal cord, um, which for some people, you know, I've heard in clinic, they've actually said, just cut my arm off and I'll be fine. So the pain can get obviously that bad. Um, now, you know, we're almost coming to that, that degree with some of these interventions. The problem is, though, that these interventions oftentimes are only transiently helpful. And uh, particularly this uh, neurectomy, you can actually develop even worse pain than you had. So you have to be very careful. Now, spinal cord stimulation, it sounds appealing. Uh, it, you know, you don't have to worry about taking a daily medication or a medicine uh, three times a day, and you just stimulate the spinal cord to stop the pain. Um, the, Difficulty with that, though, is now you have hardware in your body, just like the baclofen pump. And unlike the baclofen pump, the spinal cord stimulators, you cannot do MRIs once you have a stimulator in. And so for a lot of individuals who have transversomyelitis, if it's part of a relapsing disease, as you know, neurologists and uh, healthcare providers who take care of TM, we're obsessed with MRIs. And so this limits what we can do and how we monitor patients. So I usually, I mean, I've had a couple people have these uh, stimulators placed and, you know, there's varying success. Um, I've had some folks say, oh yeah, it takes my pain down to about 50% and others say, well, it's only about 20% improvement. So I'm not gonna go through this laundry list of pain medications and there's certainly more um, as it relates to neuropathic pain and some of these you're probably quite familiar with, but it's a trial and error. And I'm sure most of you in the audience, if you've had to deal with pain, 
you've been on not just one agent, you've been on multiple agents. And, you know, you sometimes you probably feel in the clinics, we're just flipping a coin and saying, okay, what's the next agent that we're going to try? And, you know, honestly, sometimes it is like that. We just have to keep trying one medication after another. Um, and, you know, I, what I say to people is try not to get dissuaded if the first medicine doesn't work or the second medicine doesn't work. Um, because again, it does take some time for us to sort of tease out for an individual what the good regimen is for them. Now, once an individual is on a medication that can help with neuropathic pain, what do we do? So, I mean, I can tell you what I typically do. Um, if we're gonna start someone on medication, we start, we start low and we gradually taper it up. Part of the reason why we do this is the side effects of these medications, right? If you go too fast, number one, the patient is gonna stop taking the medication because they feel awful. Um, and number two, you know, at high dosages, some of these medicines can cause some side effects. You know, we talk about bladder problems and, and transverse myelitis. Some of the medications we use for neuropathic pain can make the bladder retention worse. So we have to be mindful of that. Um, I had already mentioned that when you look at the various agents that we use, more often than not, people need more than one therapy. And then this, which I wish this happened more often, um, if you're pain-free for consecutive months, then we can start to taper off. Now, uh, Dr. Levy had mentioned, you know, the future of stem cells. And I think, you know, this is a very exciting field in, in research, and um, I'm very excited about it because I think some of these symptoms like pain have the potential to get reversed or to improve with stem cell therapy if we can treat where the, you know, the disability is or the dysfunction is. So um, that will certainly be, in my mind, a better way of uh, treating some of these symptoms versus what we have now. So chronic musculoskeletal pain. This is, as I mentioned, sort of the under-recognized pain syndromes that uh, people deal with and why does it happen? So there's several different reasons why one can get musculoskeletal discomfort. Probably one of the most common as it relates to transverse myelitis is weakness. So if you're weak, say for example, one leg is weak and you're walking around and you're you know, swinging your leg around like this, you're gonna actually cause a lot of stress, not only on the side that's affected, but on the contralateral side. That's gonna put a lot of stress in the particular joint, whether it's the hip or knee. Also, poor seating and ergonomics. So for individuals that may not be ambulatory, but they're in a wheelchair, believe it or not, simple wheelchair adjustments can help relieve some pain. Just, you know, as simple as a cushion, changing the cushion can help. Now we talked a little bit about stress on different uh, areas of the musculoskeletal system, um, including spasticity. So if you have severe spasticity, contractures occur, that can cause a, a fair amount of pain. Immobility, which I want to point this out because there's not a, a clinic that goes by where I emphasize the importance of exercise in moving joints um, because the, you know, the old adage, use it or lose it, which I think is extremely true, um, even in the non-relapsing forms of transverse myelitis, right? Because there is, um, it, it, when we talk to people, you want to make sure that you don't decondition it. And part of the reason is, is when we have stem cell therapies that we can offer people in the future, you're gonna be better suited to receive that therapy if you haven't deconditioned to a point where the therapies won't actually help you. Now, there are a couple of things that are what we refer to as iatrogenic induced or medication induced. And so steroids, so as you heard in the treatment of uh, transverse myelitis, we use a lot of steroids. Some people have to stay on steroids for consecutive months at a time, especially in the relapsing forms of transverse myelitis. And long-term steroids can lead to osteoporosis, which can lead to compression fractures, pain. And so we have to be mindful of if someone is, is um, in the clinic and describing they have focal pain in certain regions and it doesn't have that burning quality to it, maybe they have some type of osteoporotic uh, discomfort. The other thing which is um, not so common, but it does happen is avascular necrosis, which this is basically like a stroke of the bone. This can come from chronic steroid use. And it, I'll just tell you a quick side story. Um, this is, even though 
when we all go through medical school training, we read about these conditions, we learn about what can cause them. It's amazing to me how many people aren't aware of what something like avascular necrosis is. So I had a patient um, on the Eastern Shore who every so often would have these episodes that were taken sort of out of context and thought to be related to relapses for her disease. And each time she would present to the local hospital, she would be given steroids. Now, the problem is, is number one, we weren't real sure whether these were true attacks, right? And so we try to treat the true attacks with medicines like steroids. And so after about six or so months of presenting to this outside hospital and receiving steroid after steroid after steroid, she developed severe hip pain out of proportion to her normal pain syndromes. Um, so we ended up doing a hip MRI, and lo and behold, she had avascular necrosis of both hips and actually a knee, um, and she was in her mid-30s. And so when you get avascular necrosis, oftentimes that results in actually joint replacement surgery, right? Um, and so it, it's a big deal when it, when it does happen. Disc disease is very common. So you can imagine if your gait is not perfect and you're walking around, maybe you have a little bit of a limp or you're bending over, there's a, a propensity for disc disease or herniated disc, bulging disc. So this is important. I always uh, tell students and, and residents that you have to be mindful of, of this type of mechanical stress induced discomfort because you don't want to miss a herniated disc that's pushing on the central cord, which sometimes that can happen. So, you know, if a patient has weakness at baseline in their legs and they have on top of that a herniated disc that maybe makes the weakness a little bit worse, you may miss it and just say, okay, it's, it's related to your transverse myelitis that you had or maybe an infection. So going back to the MRIs, we, we love doing MRIs. And so um, that's a good way to, to look at that. Now, how do we manage this uh, chronic musculoskeletal discomfort? So there are a lot of different ways. And the best way to manage is prevention, right? And the preventative measures really incorporate the rehabilitative uh, interventions. Uh, there are a lot of very good therapists that can help people uh, with gait training. Um, the gait training may involve some of the things that you see below there, assist devices, splinting, um, seating, we already talked about as it relates to wheelchairs, and exercise. Now, I, I, I have a couple patients that um, are in a wheelchair, and they tell me, how can I exercise? I, I can't. You know, I can't move my legs. So there's no, no reason for me to exercise. That is not true at all, right? I mean, you can still exercise your core body muscle strength. You can exercise your upper arms, your neck muscles. There are a lot of uh, therapies where even for people who can't move their legs, um, they get put on this bicycle that can help stimulate their legs to move, and that's a form of exercise. So there's quite a few things that, that one can do to exercise. We mentioned the heat and ice therapy. This does go with the chronic musculoskeletal discomfort, which I think actually the, the heat and ice seems to be more effective with this type of pain than the neuropathic uh, pain. Position change. So if you notice that there's a specific position that you sit in or lay in or stand in and it's causing discomfort, you know what the treatment is? Don't do it, right? Easier said than done. Um, then there are the, a group of other interventions that um, I don't think a lot of people talk about um, because there's not a lot of uh, scientific data to support or studies haven't shown them to be effective um, because the reality is a lot of these things haven't really been studied. And so, you know, massage therapy, yoga, manipulation as it was, uh, relates to chiropractic or osteopathic manipulation, Tai Chi, there are, there's actually more press going out about yoga and Tai Chi, and there's actually some small studies looking at that um, in how it relates to pain, stress, spasticity reduction. And, you know, I encourage people to seek out um, these form of therapies in combination with the medications because it does seem to be helpful. Um, and of course, the regular pharmacological interventions, anti-inflammatory medications like the ibuprofens seem to help a little bit more and the chronic musculoskeletal uh, pain, but you have to be careful because you know you can only take so much ibuprofen before you get a nice ulcer in your stomach. So um, just to forewarn you about that. And we do use some of the neuropathic pain medication. So you'll see all over the TVs nowadays, Cymbalta and Lyrica for fibromyalgia, this musculoskeletal pain. Um, so there does seem to be some uh, improvement with the musculoskeletal pain with these medicines. 
so spasticity. So I like this. I took this from a, a colleague of mine. I thought this was a great sort of representation of what spasticity feels like in an individual, a whole bunch of rubber bands tied into one big ball. And I won't go over this in great detail because Dr. Mayer uh, talked a lot about spasticity, um, but I just highlight a couple of things. So spasticity really comes as a result of multiple tracts getting involved from transverse myelitis or from central nervous system uh, disruption. And it can manifest in any muscle group. Um, often in transverse myelitis, you know, we see that it's, it's in the arms and legs, but it can happen anywhere. Um, cold temperatures seem to aggravate it. So if you, if you speak to people, um, and this may have happened to, to you guys, you go into a pool that's very cold, and all of a sudden your leg like locks up or tightens up. Um, so you have to be mindful of that if that's one of your triggers and stay away from it if it is. And this can mask weakness, actually. So um, there are several patients that will, will come through our clinics that will tell us that, oh, I can't walk because I'm weak. Then you examine them, and you actually see that they have such bad spasticity that that's what's causing them to not walk efficiently. Then you treat the spasticity, whether it's oral medications, Botox, and lo and behold, they're actually not weak. It's just the spasticity that's limiting their ambulation. So the non-pharmacological interventions, uh, Dr. Mayer had mentioned stretching, <clears throat> range of motion. Um, and you can even think of this, even though this is not the classic uh, exercise, but in a sense, this is sort of a form of exercise, right? So these are very, very helpful. Stretching helps send signals back to the muscle to relax. Um, positioning we talked about and these other things here. Pharmacological management, um, there are several agents that we use. The most common, as Dr. Mayer had already mentioned, baclofen, tizanidine. Um, I can't say that I use dantrolene that often. Um, just, I don't know, I'm scared of it, I think. Um, so I oftentimes will, will go to some of these other therapies that are listed here. And similar to neuropathic pain, you need a cocktail of medications oftentimes to treat spasticity. Um, there was mention already about baclofen pump. Um, so this, you know, feasibly, you would think that this is the best treatment you could do, right? You administer medication locally to where the problem is. Um, but there are some disadvantages related to that. We really reserve baclofen pump placements for individuals that fail the oral medications. And I would even say, now that we have Botox and some of the other injectable therapies, even after that. And Dr. Mayer already mentioned about the Botox. So it's a whirlwind tour of pain and I didn't cover everything, but um, you know, just to highlight, so pain is very common in transverse myelitis. Uh, we know that there seem to be now sort of differentiation of, with respect to how bad the transverse myelitis is and how bad the pain could be long-term or intractable. Um, you have to look at pain as a multidisciplinary approach to treating it. So both pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions and actually having multiple specialists involved in treating pain. That could be the neurologist, the physiatrist, the pain management specialist, um, the non sort of westernized, you know, like acupuncturist, um, and I think that really, uh, it, at least in my experience, helps the person the most if we can sort of bring all these fields together. And I don't want to forget Dr. Kaplan's back there. Psychiatry, I think, is actually critical because, again, like I mentioned in one slide, you don't know what comes first, depression, pain, and they feed off of each other. And so we really need to um, treat all that we can associated with pain. I like to end with this since it was somewhat of a painful topic. So there you go. This is the last vacation I took, by the way. And this was, uh, what, just before graduating medical school for a, so a long time ago. No, it's actually in Italy. Yeah. Okay, thank you.